So the same happens in AI. You give an AI system any reward function to optimize any objective, and as it optimizes that function, it will have side effects. It'll find dangerously creative solutions to make that number go up. We see this all the time in computer vision. So classic example is like you have a bunch of images of uh, cows in green pastures, and uh, this AI system is trained to recognize the animal. Oh, it's a cow. Oh, it's a it's a horse or whatever. But the AI system learns that like, oh no, green pastures are always associated with cows, and it's easier to optimize by learning to recognize a green pasture than a cow. And so now you have a system that like is a green pasture detector rather than a cow detector, and you deploy that in the real world, and you know if it's a self-driving car or something, that could cause some real problems. So this like dangerously creative solutioneering that AI systems um, engage in is really what you want to look out for if you start to build a system that is so good at optimizing a metric, it will find clever hacks that you never thought of that can make that number go up. Like if you just naively said, oh, I think the, the world would be better if everybody was happy and smiling. I mean, expect a super intelligent AI to like, you know, graft a smile on everyone's faces in a super terrifying dystopic setup. Um, the ultimate example of this is something called a paperclip maximizer, which you may have yeah. heard of. Yeah. Yeah, I, Nick Bostrom. Yeah, I don't know if it's useful for me to mention that or... or no, please, because I'm sure probably most people haven't heard of it. It just, yeah. Yeah, no, of course. So so yeah. we're invited in this scenario to imagine a world, let's say 15 years from now, when there's this, uh, this artificial general intelligence that's developed at a paperclip factory. And the paperclip factory people go, ooh, good, an artificial general intelligence will be rich. We'll get it to optimize for the number of paperclips we produce. And so they do. And this uh, paperclip uh, generator ends up realizing a couple things quite quickly. So first off, it can only generate paperclips if it's still around, if it's still turned on. And as long as there are annoying little humans running around who might risk wanting to turn it off for whatever reason at some point, it has a damn good reason to prevent those humans from ever turning it off. If it gets turned off, no paperclips, the reward function doesn't go up. So right mm -hmm. away, it has an incentive to stop or kill or disable somehow all the humans in its immediate area. It also has mm -hmm. incentives to get smarter because no matter what you're trying to accomplish, you're always better off if you're smarter at accomplishing that task. And so it has reasons to convince people to give it access to more processing power, more GPUs, more, more everything to get more competent at what it does. Uh, it also mm -hmm. has an incentive to gather resources. So, you know, paper clips take iron, presumably, to make. I'm not a paper clip expert. Maybe it's steel or whatever. But the bottom line is you need raw materials. There is iron in the ground. There's iron in the moon. There's iron in people's blood. Oops. And now you have this myopic optimization, very competent optimization. That's the point. It's super, super competent optimization. The problem is it was for a number that makes you go, oh, no, I didn't mean that. And by the time you say that, everything is over. So once you start building these systems that are optimizing for narrow metrics like that, you are inviting this category of risk. The, um, these little goals, by the way, that I've mentioned, so the AI wanting to make sure that it continues to exist, uh, accumulating resources, making itself more capable and intelligent, these are known as instrumental goals. So there's this concept of highly powerful AI systems always converging on the same set of goals. You know, you can expect a super intelligent AI never to want itself to be turned off because no matter what its reward is, it's always gonna be better off being turned on. It's always gonna be better off being more intelligent, having more resources, right? We all do this. Money is an instrumental goal for many humans. I may not know why I want a million dollars right now, but I can tell you I'd be happier if I had it. Um, so there's a sense in which these instrumental goals are the real risk class and preventing the instrumental goals from getting in the way of human flourishing is the central goal of AI alignment research. Mm. That was incredible. I, you know, hearing you say things like you just said makes me feel like I should make the podcast only about <laughs> AI safety. But then that's what you've already done. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, no, I, I honestly think more people should be talking about this. And I think you'd be in a great position to, to do it too. Cause like there are a lot of, I think there are a lot of different arguments and angles and, and people are convinced by different things. So there are some people who think that AGI isn't possible. There's some people who think that if AGI happens, it's not going to be a concern because instrumental convergence for whatever reason, isn't a real risk. Um, there, there's like so many different perspectives on this. And I think having 
people tackling this question from different angles with different prior beliefs is super valuable. So, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think it would be great. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it just, it, once you kind of frame, so that episode that we had a few episodes ago, episode 559, where we're talking about GPT-3 and we're talking about what's hap- what's capable next. As somebody who is, can understand what's going on to some extent, you know, I'm not a GPT-3 expert like Melanie is, but it does seem like AGI in our lifetimes is likely. And then given that it's likely and given that this thing that you've described. So as soon as we have AGI, that AGI can maybe trivially create artificial superintelligence. And because we don't know, because we've never had an artificial superintelligence algorithm and because we in our individual brain don't have enough processing power to imagine what could happen, uh, we should start to be trying to build some kinds of safeguards around that if we can. Maybe it's a futile exercise, but we might as well try. And um, a really good way, going back to that Tim Urban blog post series on AI, that I always come back to as a way of explaining, while even though we can't imagine what AI is capable of, we should definitely be wary of it. Is So if you think about, the, he, he imagines it, or he describes it as a staircase, where each step of the staircase is a different level of intelligence. And so you've got like worms at the bottom of the staircase, bugs, and as you climb up the staircase, then you've got your chipmunk that you talked about earlier, you've got your cat, you've got your monkeys, then you've got great apes, you've got chimpanzees and bonobos, and then right now of all of the species that are alive on the planet today, we've got humans at the top of this ladder. And we know that humans are really big dicks to everyone Mm -hmm. lower on the ladder. We step on bugs, almost everyone. seems like in parts of India, they don't step on bugs. But most of the world, we're just stepping on bugs. We don't even care about their intelligence for a second. Most of us don't uh, like just kill dogs or monkeys, but some people do. And some people will even capture, torture other humans who just happen to be not as strong or as smart as them or didn't have some kind of informational advantage at some point in time or some geographic advantage. And humans have been doing that to other humans in really sick ways for millennia. And they, thankfully, on a per capita basis, it happens less and less. But um, as... uh, yeah, as we see in countless salient events in the world today, it's still humans are still trying to like attack each other and imprison each other and change ideologies. And no, you're not thinking about your government the right way. You got to do it our way. Yeah. And um, and if you don't listen, I've got bombs and stuff. So why why would then something that's even smarter than us also just happen to be benevolent? Right, right. And, and actually, I think there's an important aspect to this, too, which is humans are, are uh, probably a, a more optimistic case. Uh, I hate to be doom and gloom about this, but like a large part of the selective pressure that evolution has exerted on humans has had to do with forcing us to cooperate with each other. So you think about right. great uh, human civilizations, right? There's a story of, of um, genetic selection, but there's also a story of cultural selection. Cultures and societies that were able to foster coordination and cooperation between individuals within them tended to become dominant. That's what we see. You know, if you want to tell the story of, of, of the West through that lens, you certainly can. You can say like, oh, well, the reason that the US is so dominant today is because it figured out how to um, manage power transitions in a peaceful way, get people to cooperate at a massive scale. Uh, that's great. But what are the selective pressures? Again, back to this idea of how are we approaching AI? Uh, or how are we approaching intelligence through AI as contrasted by evolution? Well, we're certainly not approaching it through a vector that overtly requires cooperation. As far as I can tell, what we're doing is we're cranking the knob as hard as we can on scaling with objectives that are 
really detached from anything to do with cooperation. They're interesting. There's interesting research being done at, at like DeepMind, for example, on you know cooperation between reinforcement learning agents, that sort of thing. That's great, but it's not a question of like you know, will we be able to make a safe one? It's a question of, will we be able to prevent a bad one from being made? And these two questions are distinct. And to some degree, uh, the ability to, to influence what kind of AI we end up with is both a function of how well you can solve the technical alignment problem. Right? How, how can you make sure that you build uh, an agent that's more intelligent than you, but that doesn't do something like maximize paper clips at some point? That's a technical problem, AI alignment. And then there's a separate policy problem. How do you ensure global coordination? How do you make sure that countries that maybe don't care as much about safety or groups that don't care as much about safety don't get an edge on uh, AI development, don't end up developing something in an unsafe context, even if we have the technical solution to this alignment problem? Um, right. So that's where policy and technical AI safety wow. are two important sides of this equation.